Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord? A fully and for fully declare his praise. Blessed are they who maintain just justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your pe people. Come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share the joy of your, na of your nation, enjoying your inheritance in giving praise. That's Psalm 106, 1 through 5. A few weeks ago, we began looking. Is this really loud? It's really loud to me. I'm going to walk over here as I talk. We started a series. Is that better? Okay. A few weeks ago, we started a series called In All Things Give Thanks. And our, our, our verse for this series is 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So this is week four, and this week we're looking at a thanksgiving of praise. A thanksgiving of praise. Psalm 105, 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clashing cymbals. That's a drummer's dream right there. Right? <laughs> let everything that has breath, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Last week, we looked at a message called a Thanksgiving of Worship. Now, what is the difference between worship and praise? Remember what we said last week? Remember what we said worship is? What worship means? Worship is a grateful language to God as an act of worship. Shaka is the Hebrew word for worship. In the Old Testament, this word is found 170 times, and it shows how important it really is. It's the act of bowing down before a superior or a ruler. Shaka is used as a common theme for coming before God in worship. Sometimes it's in conjunction with another Hebrew verb for bowing down physically. The New Testament, the, the Greek verb is proskoneo, which means to kneel or prostrate oneself in honor or supplication of a human being or in worship of God. It means to fall to the ground and worship or fall to one's knees and worship. So to worship God is a physical act that is done in accordance with the heart. We talked about last week, the greatest way to worship is in prayer. <coughs> It's in prayer. We worship the Lord in prayer. It's our greatest way to worship Him. The right prayer begins with worship. Worship is the gateway to an intimate prayer life with God. So, if that's what worship is, what does praise mean? Because we have to group those two words together. We often put these together and talk about church, especially music. Well, worship and praise, worship and praise. But do these two go together? James 5, 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Do we sing praise when we're cheerful? No. We should. What does praise mean? Praise to be ascribed to God in respect to His glory. What is His glory? It is the exhibition of His character and operations. All right? There are many different words that translate into our word praise. They mean things like play an instrument for God, to 
speak in praise of virtue, excellence, sacrificial offering, but the one we're looking at today is the Greek word humneo. Humneo means to sing to, to laud, sing to the praise of. So when we sing our praises to God, we are singing praises of God. Get your mind around that. When we sing our praises to God, we are singing praises of God. It's important for us to remember. We're not just singing our praises to God, we're singing the praises of Him. Acts 16, 25 and 26, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas had been thrown in jail because of Jesus. Right? And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. When's the last time you were singing praise to God, an earthquake happened? Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prison were shaken. The foundations were shaken. If you remember the story, the jailkeeper, man, he all this happy, happy because after the doors are off the hinges and all the chains are loosed off all the inmates, and he grabs his sword to kill himself because he knew they're all gone and gonna kill him anyway. And Paul cries out, Hey, don't harm yourself, we're all still here. He called for lights, other soldiers came, and all the prisoners were still sitting right there. Chains were off, but they were all good. He brought Paul and Silas in his home, dressed their wounds, they'd been beaten before they were put in there. And then the jail, the jail keeper and his entire family were saved and baptized. How <coughs> must I do to be saved? So here they are in jail. They're praying. They're singing hymns to God. Right? So were Paul and Silas worshiping? They weren't laying their face before God. They weren't even on one knee, but they're chained to the wall. Were they worshiping before they were praising? I would say they probably were. You see, God knows our limitations. God knew they couldn't go in their face before Him. Plus, the pleasure they were was going to be filthy, nasty, rats running around. It says they were praying. So they start off praying. And they're, they're, they're praying to God. And then they start singing praises to God. They were in worship and praise. They were praying and singing. As a result, God gets all excited and God gets the shivers and an earthquake happens. Think about it, man. Why did everybody get God got excited? And the place was shaken. Matthew 26, 30, Mark 14, 26. Both these say, and when they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his disciples had finished what we call, well, they had finished Passover. Communion was, was put into that. Jesus did it. And when they finished, as was tradition, they went out singing <coughs> Hymns to God. Now then, both these places in Acts with Paul and Silas and the upper room, when they were done with, with Passover and communion, when they were finished, they went out. Both times, if you study up the word, you find they were singing what's called Paschal hymns. Okay? The Paschal hymns are Psalms 113 through 118 and Psalm 136. When they left the upper room, they were singing Psalm 118. Psalm 118? Really? Now remember, they're leaving the upper room. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus knows he is going to be betrayed. He's going to be beat up, drug off, and, and right, we put on trial. He knows what's coming. They're singing Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And they're singing this as they always did. I have a tune went. I wish I did. For steadfast love endures forever. I'm going to see Jesus singing this part. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His disciples sing it. For steadfast love endures forever. Jesus saying, Let Israel say, the disciples say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. 
In Psalm 118, they were singing this. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side, is my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Jesus is singing Psalm 118 before he's, it all breaks loose. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. And they sing 118. He goes on to the next page. Right? But these are called Paschal hymns. Right? After the fourth cup of Passover, Psalm 115 through 118 were sung. They knew these by heart because they sang them. We taste it. If you want to learn God's word, put it to music and sing it often. So many of the newer songs today that we sing are God's word put to music. The old hymns, we tell you something about the old hymns, they are the theology. That's the theology of God. The newer hymns, the newer songs, are God's word put to music. Both are important. Both are important. Right? Right? Now, when we look up the Greek word for sing, we find that it is used always of praise to God. Can't you just see Paul and Silas chained up and they get into deep prayer to God and he lifts their spirits up and they get excited and begin singing the Paschal hymns or these songs and the more they're singing, they're not singing quiet. Because they've already got their spirits lifted up and now they're in a good mood. Although they're still chained, they still have their backs all torn being beat. They're in jail, they're, they're praying, they're experienced. And now they're singing these pastoral hymns. And the more they sing, the, la the louder they get. If you study this out, it shows they were singing robust hymns. They were singing quite spiritual songs. They were singing out loud and they were getting excited to God. And all the prisoners were listening. They were witnessing to those other prisoners in worship, in prayer, and in song, in praise. And they were singing, the more they sang these robust hymns, the stronger it got. And they got more excited as they sang, and God got excited with them and just shook the whole place up. Maybe we need to try that on Sunday mornings. The more we sing, the more robust and excited we get. The more excited and robust we sing, the louder we get. And the more we sing, the more excited we get, the louder we sing. And we get all excited about God. Oh, but brother, I can't do that in church. I must be solemn. Oh. Why? What glory does that bring to anybody? Are you a monk in a monastery? Let me tell you, monks shut up in a monastery and doesn't bring glory to God. Get out there among the common man doing God's work. That's when it gets real. That goes for us too. We walk out that door, we're entering the mission field. After Jesus led his disciples in Passover in the first communion, they sang, they sang hymns as they went out of the upper room. They tell you the Israelites sang these hymns when they went up the steps going into Jerusalem. All these steps. When they were going into worship. They were singing these Paschal hymns. They knew of the children knew them, but they sang all the time. Why did they do this? Because they knew it was important. They knew the kids need to learn God's word and they sang the Paschal hymns. They sang them with gladness. They sang them with a joyful heart. Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to, the, to, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does it tell us to do? Be singing. Bringing our praise. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song. Is singing important in God's word? Revelation 14, 2 and 3. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living cre creatures and before the, el the, el the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. When I was in Africa back in 2010, in Namibia, a mission, mission trip, and, and, and the church we were helping get going, and, and we were there every night with them, and I was the first white man to get to preach in that church, which was really cool. But had a translator going to from English to a bambu, and but what night we get for sure? You know, in, in, in Africa the clocks don't mean a whole lot there. They don't get excited about time. We get all worried about it. They don't. If they go for church for an hour, they feel cheated. Just telling you. But one night we get there, there's a soccer game going. One of the big soccer teams on TV next door, so church had to wait. Dare them. Church had to wait because their soccer team was playing, professional soccer team, you know. They call it football, but they were playing and had to wait. And the building had this area over here, and the next door is a church. And so I'm not big on soccer, so I walked next door. What was going on next door was singing. And the ladies who led the music in the church were working on music. And I sat there and recorded some of them and listened to them sing in their native language. I didn't understand what they were saying. This is the most beautiful singing I've ever heard in my life. I couldn't learn their song. I didn't speak their language. But I sat there and I was in the presence of God with them singing. It didn't matter if I understood them. God did. Revelation 15, 2 and, 3, 2 and 3. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and a song of the Lamb. Singing is important. Study God's word from front to back, and you'll find where singing takes place in all the important events. They made sure. What am I trying to say this morning? Past four weeks, I've been learning about the real Thanksgiving, about being thankful, about knowing that we have something to be thankful for. We started this series, and all things give thanks. Week one was, what is Thanksgiving? What is Thanksgiving? It's a prayer that offers thanks to God, an expression or act of giving thanks, public acknowledgement or celebration of divine goodness. It is us admitting we cannot do it on our own, that we need God. It's us turning things over to God, trusting in God so, we, so that He can build an attitude of thanksgiving in us will produce His Kind of faith. We said, uh, we said Thanksgiving is giving thanks and that it is a choice. We had a choice that we give thanks or not. We can choose to thank God or blame God, give Him praise or take the praise, show gratitude or show contempt. We, give, we, can, we can give God lip service or our complete devoted service. Week two was Thanksgiving of Grace. We began looking at things to be thankful for. 
things that we may not associate with giving thanks. So we too we looked at, at being thankful for grace. What is thanksgiving and grace? Very simply put, it's thanking God for the salvation, for the grace of salvation. Grace is God's redemption at Christ's expense. Grace is God's unmerited favor. We cannot earn it by work for it or be religious enough for it. It comes from God. God's grace is God loving the unlovable, seeking the fugitive, rescuing the, hope, the hopeless, lifting the beggar from the dunghill to make him sit among princes. The only way that we can obtain grace is through Jesus Christ. Here's my mom passed away in 13 and we were cleaning her house out and I was going through the piano bench because you know some of the music in there was actually mine I wanted to take it home and and we found a card in there the mom's handwriting on this card it said to Father God there's a sealed envelope to Father God well, we all discussed it and decided I should be the one to open it. So I opened up this card. Here's what I read. Oh, Lord, my God, I bow before you to bring thanks for all the benefits of life. Thank you for your plan of salvation for Jesus Christ, who gave himself a sacrifice for me. I love you. In Jesus' name, Winna Wilson, Winna Wilson, November 30th, 2001. Very simple little card. I still have that card. Simple card my mother wrote to God, sealed it up. Put it with her music, as you know, mother was all about music. Not all of that, but she also was about God's Word. Right? Week three, last week was a Thanksgiving of worship. We already talked about what that entails. Well, this week, week four, we're learning about Thanksgiving of praise. So how do all these tie together? How do all four of these tie together? I believe that we must get into a lifestyle of being thankful, not just on Thanksgiving, but all 365 days of the year. You see, we train ourselves to be thankful for different things. Be thankful for what God has given us. Be thankful how God has blessed us. We need to be thankful when we don't see the blessings. We talked this morning in class. When we pray for rain, we thank God for it before He sends it. If we do, we're praying in faith. We pray for something, thanking God for it as if it's already been done. That's called faith. You know, we have a lifestyle of being thankful. We need to be sharing God's grace with others. We need to be a people of prayer. We need to be a church of prayer. We need to be, we need to be praying for this church. You know the, do, you, do you know what the greatest church building method is? If you want to build your church and make it bigger, you know what the greatest method is to do that? Prayer. Prayer. We've got to get serious in our prayer. And we really get into a thankful life. A life of grace and prayer. We'll be singing our praises to God. I don't know how many times in my prayer time I start praying and end up singing. See, that's what this sermon is all about today. It's about singing. On Sunday mornings, what is the one thing we all do together? We sing. Now, you may say, well, we all pray together. Usually, when I'm up there praying, you're waiting for what you're doing. Be honest. Right? So, what's one thing we all do together? We sing. Maybe not all sing at the same time in the same song, but always we sing at one time or another. Give it solidly in our heart. We sing. We sing. Praising God is a choice. 
Praising God is a choice we must make. We all praise something. We all praise someone. When we're out there screaming for those bobcats or for those tigers, we're screaming praises to them. Maybe not as a coach, but we're singing, we're, 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 we're screaming our praises to those kids, whether it be football or volleyball or basketball, whatever. We're telling those kids, hey, we're supporting you, yay. Go team. We need to choose what we praise. And we need to be praising God. Here we are at Thanksgiving, right? We're doing our Thanksgiving dinner today. And, you know, another week has going to be Thanksgiving Day. There's a lot of things we can be thankful for in a lot of many ways we can give thanks through music and prayer and song and by sharing Jesus. So, do worship and praise go together? Yeah, they do. They say better. The more we worship, the more we praise, and the more we do that, the better off we are. I want to share with you the story of Old Hay. It happens every Friday evening almost without fail. When the sun resembles a giant orange and is staring, starting to dip into the blue, ocean, the blue ocean, old Ed comes strolling along the beach to his favorite pier, clutching his bony hand in a bucket of shrimp. Ed walks out to the end of the pier where it seems he almost has the world to himself. The glow of the sun is a golden bronze now. Everybody's gone except for a few joggers on the beach. Sitting at the end of the pier, Ed is alone with his thoughts and his bucket of shrimp. Before long, however, he is no longer alone. Up in the sky, a thousand white dots come screeching and squawking and winging their way toward the lanky frame standing there at the end of the pier. Before long, dozens of seagulls have enveloped him, their wings fluttering and flapping wildly. Ed stands there tossing shrimp to the hungry birds. In a few short minutes, the bucket is empty, but dead, but Ed doesn't leave. He stands there lost in thought, as though transported to another time and place. Invariably, one of the goals will land on his sun-bleached, weather-beaten hat, an old military hat he'd been wearing for years. When he finally turns around and begins to walk back toward the beach, a few of the birds hop along the pier with him until he gets to the stairs, and then they too fly away. And old Ed quietly makes his way down to the end of the beach and on home. If you're sitting there on the pier with your fishing line in the water, Ed might seem like a funny old man. To onlookers, he's just another old cod, another, another old cod, cod, codger lost in his own weird world, feeding seagulls with a bucket full of shrimp. To the onlooker, Rituals may look either very strange or very empty. They can seem altogether unimportant, maybe even a lot of nonsense. Old folks often do strange things. Most of them would probably ride old Ed off down there in Florida. And that's too bad. You see, they'd do well to know him better. His full name, Eddie Rickenbacker. He was a famous war hero of World War I and World War II. A successful driver, race car driver, he earned his nickname Fast Eddie and participated in 1912, 1914, 15, and 16 Indianapolis 500s. His best and only finish was placed in 10th in 1914. The other years, his car broke down. Among his, achieve, his achievements was setting a, a race speed record of 134 miles an hour while driving a blitz and bends. In addition to fame, racing proved extremely lucrative for Rick for Rickenbacker, and he earned over forty thousand dollars a year as a driver back then. During his time as a driver, his interest in aviation increased as a result of various encounters with pilots. When World, World War I broke out, Eddie joined up, and although considered to be too old, he joined the Air Corps and soon became an ace. By the end of the war, he totaled 26 enemy aircraft down and the top American score of the war. 
Returning home, he became the most celebrated aviator in America. In America. After speaking on a Liberty Bond tour, Rickenbacker wrote his memoirs entitled Fighting the Flying Circus, where he fought against the famed Red Baron. After war was over, he bought the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, operated the track until 1945, introduced bank curves and significantly upgraded everything. Continuing his connection to aviation, Rick Rickenbacker bought Eastern Airlines in 1938. Negotiating with the federal government to purchase airbell routes, he revolutionized how commercial airlines worked. With the outbreak of World War II, Rickenbacker volunteered his services to the, go to, the go to the government. Although too old to fight, he was used in different ways like inspecting air bases and dispatched him to the Pacific on a similar tour as well as to deliver a secret message to General Douglas MacArthur. It was on this mission of flying across the Pacific, he and his seven-member crew went down. Miraculously, all the men survived, crawled out of their plane, climbed into the life raft. Captain Rick Rickenbacker and his crew floated for days on the rough waters of the Pacific. Of the Pacific. They fought the sun, they fought sharks, most of all, they fought hunger. On the eighth day, the rations ran out. No food, no water. There were hundreds of miles from land, and no one knew where they were. They needed a miracle. That afternoon, they had a simple devotional service and prayed for just that, a miracle. They tried to nap. Eddie leaned back, pulled his military cap over his nose. Time dragged. All he could hear was a slap of waves against the raft. Suddenly, Eddie felt something land on top of his cap. It was a sea gull. Old Ed would later describe how he sat perfectly still, planning his next move. With a flash of his hand and a squawk from the gull, he managed to grab it and wring its neck. He tore the, fed, fed, the, uh, fed, fed, the, he tore the feathers off, and his starving crew made a meal, a very slight meal for eight men. Then they used the intestines for bait. With it, they caught fish, which gave them food and more bait, and the cycle continue, continue, continued. With that simple survival technique, they were able to endure the rigors of sea till they were found and rescued after 24 days at sea. A. Rickenbacker lived many years beyond this ordeal, but never forgot the sacrifice of the first living seagull. That's why almost every Friday night, he would walk to the end of the pier with a bucket full of shrimp and a heart full of gratitude. Ed stands there tossing shrimp to the hungry birds. As he does, if you listen closely, you can hear him say with a smile, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you say thank you enough? Do we say thank you enough to God? Ask yourself this morning, what do I praise? Who do I praise above God? If there's anything you praise above God, you need to repent and praise God first. I'm going to pray for you this morning. We learned about Thanksgiving this month. Do you tell God, thank you the way you should? And I'll be asking different ones to stand up at different times, so if, if you feel like you, if the Holy Spirit prompts you to stand, please do so. Because at one point, we're all going to be standing. Okay? I want to ask you, are you more likely to give thanks or to complain? Do you look for reasons to give thanks or to look for fault. Would you say today you need prayer so that you can become a person of thanksgiving? <coughs> that you need to learn and remember to give thanks first. If this is you, would you please stand up so I can pray for you? If you're one who needs to learn to give thanks first. Father, you 
see those that are standing this morning. They are saying they need to give thanks first and foremost. Father, forgive us for not thanking you as we should. Put in our hearts an attitude of gratitude. Let us speak thanks and not complaints. Show us how to fill your ears with praise. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Please be seated. Now I want to ask you this. Are you a person who gives thanks first? A person who has an attitude of gratitude. If this is you, if you always give thanks first, all you stand so I can pray for you. Now let's all stand up. I want to pray for all of us. Father, bless this church, the people of this church. Remind us all what we have to be thankful for. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. He gave up his throne in heaven to become a man and lived on this earth. He suffered and he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who comes to comfort and to convict us and to reveal your word to us. Thank you for being God, the God of all gods. Father God, I thank you. Amen. Invitation this morning, command on your feet. Maybe this morning you need to, you need to come and, and spend some time in prayer. Maybe this morning you just need to come and tell God thank you. Your invitation song, I want to ask you to come. <coughs> 